fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Uh, joining us today is uh, Phyllis, Phyllis Chesler, and we're going to be talking about her new book coming out called Requiem for a Female Serial Killer. Thank you for taking the time, Phyllis. It's my pleasure to be with you. Um, well, first of all, um, how did you get into um, true crime and, and this sort of area enough to get into writing a book? Well, I'm a newbie to, to true crime. What drew me to the Eileen Warnos case, um, and that's the serial killer that I'm writing about, were the issues that her case raised, namely that violence against prostitutes is routine and horrifying and perhaps the most extreme form of violence against women. What drew me was a desire to tell this to the jury, to assemble a team of experts to explain that, yeah, even a prostitute has the right to kill in defense of her life, and so do women, by the way, and uh, that it is conceivable, it is not impossible, that a prostituted woman uh, would have had to kill in self-defense. And uh, that's what drew me into the case. I had a political women's rights vision, idealism, goal, and I wanted, since the media was all over this case, from all around the world, it was quite extraordinary, uh, a Florida-based case, I thought, well, then it would be a way of raising the conversation globally on the, these subjects. That's what drew me in. It took me a long time to realize that I had stepped into a serial killer's life. I mean, a real serial killer, and I was not someone who watched true crime very much. Um, yes, the subject is utterly important and interesting, but it wasn't my speciality. So it took me a long time to acknowledge that, yes, yeah, she is a serial killer, a very unique kind, none like her before or since, and not like male serial killers either, I was focused on her rough life in childhood and then as a hitchhiking prostitute. I, I, I don't think I've ever come across a more terrible childhood in the United States. Uh, I, I'm sure there, there's close examples, but this was Michigan and it was beyond awful. Not a single adult in her town, in her school, in her life, in her family, rescued her. When, indeed, in childhood, she might have been difficult or had a brain injury or various cognitive impairments, vision difficulties, hearing difficulties. Impairments, not difficulties. And I'm, not, I'm a psychologist by training, but I'm not about to say that, that that the abuse is what led her to kill. No. no. Because there is so much abuse, and not everyone kills, right? Right. I was going to say that. Um, it, it, she could have a really, really bad life, but uh, um, there's a lot of people that have terrible early lives that don't turn out to be killers. Um, exactly. So, so what do you think it is? Do you think it's something that um, she was born with? Or are we born with as humans uh, uh, the, the part to kill and then we grow out of it, we learn out of it? Or is it something that we learn from our, our society? 
what a good question that and, and we don't have a good enough answer as yet. I think she had um both a traumatic brain injury and organic brain syndrome, which is not a good start because it often leads to sociopathic behavior or is correlated with sociopathic behavior. And she, I have to say it's a mixture of genes because her father was a pedophile who hung himself in jail. He was a wife batterer, which is partly why her biological mother was run out of town by her biological grandparents who adopted her and didn't tell her that they were not her parents. So like any number of serial killers, she's also adopted. And then she was beaten and beaten badly and repetitively and began selling sex for food or cigarettes when she was 10, 9, 10 years old. Yeah, the boys, the boys in her neighborhood were not, were particularly cruel and used her. Did did they not? This is absolutely true. Called her ugly, bad names, and still had sex with her, and then gave her cigarettes. And very little sympathy was shown her, but by the adults. The adults didn't rescue her from uh, childhood bullying and rape and so on. Although when she was 12 and a half, maybe, uh, a friend of her father, grandfather's, who was a big drunk, by the way, uh, as was her grandmother, mother, he offered to give her a ride. She was walking. It was raining. And he raped her in the woods. And she became pregnant. So unlike, for example, male serial killers, they don't get pregnant and then they don't have to give up a child for adoption when they're going on 14. This is a traumatic experience. So it's in addition to terrible extreme abuse, then there's this. And at that point, she told her aunt, who was her sister, or was presented as her sister, that men hate our guts. And that was an interesting statement from someone who really loved men quite a lot and liked them and was very affectionate uh, with her Johns, with her customers, which is unusual, as if she imagined this was the closest she could come to affection or to a real relationship of some kind. So I would say, in her case, she was born bad and then really leaned on to become... She didn't get bad. I mean, when I say born bad, she began drinking. She be tried to beat up a bartender in a bar. I mean, when she was in her teens, she would do joy rides. She behaved like a male juvenile delinquent with no awareness of social rules or with no concern for them. So she should have... <laughs> This is, you know, even now we have this going on everywhere. Somebody should have tried to help her. Nobody did. Somebody perhaps should have even tried to get her glasses so she could see and hearing aids so she could really hear and maybe medication, which may not have existed um, at the time that would moderate aggressive violent physical behavior, unusual in a woman. So she also tried to kill herself six times, and she failed. She even failed at that. And she had heart. When I asked her to tell me how many times she'd been raped, her response totally stopped my heart because... Her definition of rape was not my definition. I mean, yes, she considered it rape if John wanted to have sex with her but wouldn't pay her or wanted her. Yeah, that was, that was rape. Hmm. Uh, her definition was when you were gang raped, when you were tied down, when you were beaten so badly you were not recognizable by the police as male or female, when you were really tortured 
and sex was involved. This was her, and she had this 50 times that she could remember offhand. And I tried to stop her. I said, you don't have to continue. It's okay, because we, we now know what being raped once can do to a woman or to a man, and um, you can feel unsafe thereafter. I mean, a lot of terrible things can happen. But this was her life. This was her every day. It was normalized. Um, and she considered herself very tough, and she was proud that she could take it, that it wasn't going to stop her, that she had a hustle. It's how she earned her living. It's how she earned her daily bread. So if you put this bad genes and then enormous, atrocious abuse, add, add that to the mix, and then the use of women as prostitutes and what that really means. It's not like happy hooker, I'm just saving to go to medical school, I couldn't be happier. The, the real, and I know, uh, Alan, that you wrote in chains, and so you have some very good idea about what trafficking and prostitution is about, and it's very young, young people, mainly women, but men too, boys, mm -hmm. and they have had incest in their lives and enormous poverty and terrifying dysfunctionality in their families, and um, then, and they get lured or sold or tracked into prostitution as the way out of a terrible home life, and then it becomes only much worse, and it's very hard to leave thereafter for many different reasons. And so she couldn't leave. She didn't leave. She had nothing else she could do. Why do you think she was giving her John so much uh, affection and being very nice to them? I think it is very possible that now, I don't always trust IQ exams, and she had one when she was a, in a state reform school for a brief period of time in Michigan. Um, she may have had a low IQ. She may have had cognitive impairments. So in some ways, she was like a child. She would get only enough money for a couple days in a motel room and for food and beer and music, right? Mm. The only time she had a sum of money, her brother died and it was an insurance policy, uh, she blew it in three months, $10,000, didn't use it for anything productive, and then the car which she bought was repossessed. So uh, ask me the question again. I want to come at it another way. Well, well, why in particular would she show uh, people she was paying to have sex with, um, you know, like that, that affection? I wish I had a, a very, very definitive answer. I think that she thought these were real relationships, that these were her friends, even though... <laughs> Even though she had all of the extraordinary, typical rough stuff and violence and danger and near-death experiences, the nice Johns were kind of like her friends. They were like her customers because most prostitutes don't hold hands with or hug and kiss a John. This is, like, really unusual. So I think that she was a bit primitive or maybe a lot primitive and a little bit like a child mentally. I mean, in addition to not knowing social rules, she and she thought that she thought she was really smart, and like other serial killers, men mainly, she amazed me by talking about. Now I'm in history. I've gone down in history. I've made history, and that was one of the things that amazed me. But. I think there was a child in her that had not grown up. What What do you think it was that first caused her to kill the first time? Like, what, what, what put her over that? I believe with my whole heart and mind that this was self-defense. The man she killed was a known uh, 
pornography addict, sex addict, a prostitute addict, and she just happened to be picked up by him, Richard Mallory, someone who did 10 years in Maryland for his bad sexual behavior, which, by the way, is also interesting because he must have tried to rape in a woman's home the wrong man's wife or the wrong man's daughter because he was really put away. But it didn't teach him because he then went on to just, that's what he did. And there would have been a witness, for example, his one of his former girlfriends who wanted to testify. The judge wouldn't allow it. And she wanted to talk about how violent he was and how over-the-top sexual he was. He had a bad history. But that wasn't allowed, and the, the trial was not fair at all, but uh, in many, many ways. But I believe, I believe her story, and she took the stand, the only one on her behalf, and it was moving, incredible, in my opinion, and she did rescind it later on as she became more and more insane because if you live in isolation on death row, that's what happens. But she, that's what usually happens. And she found Christ, too. So I believe it was a battle for her life. And she killed him. Uh, um, what a lucky break that was for her. And then she didn't pose him the way serial killers pose women in some obscene gynecological position. She covered up his body. And um, she didn't want the, the vultures pecking at him. And took off and didn't tell anyone for a while. Then she told the woman who she really loved and with whom she was living. Uh, and both of them, by the way, have talked to me about they're not really lesbians, but they love each other. Okay, make of it what you will. So um, it well, was that's, so that's, intense. But that's, that's pretty interesting that she... Uh she killed him in self-defense, but yet she still covered him up because she didn't want yes. the birds to peck at him. I mean, because that's a caring motion. And that's maybe correct. She wouldn't, yeah, so maybe she's not like a man where she's going to pose this guy and try to bring a, you know, degrade it look. Right. But right. she actually did a caring thing by protecting him from the birds. Yeah, and she did it with several other men who she killed subsequently. Mm. Wasn't that weird? In her first confession... Well, it's different. In her first yeah. confession, she said self-defense 16 times. And guess what? The jury never heard that because it was edited out of the confession videotape. Oh. So I write about how I compare her trial to that of Ted Bundy. And the prosecutor in her case was John Tanner, the spiritual advisor to Ted Bundy, the one who tried to hold off his execution because he was beginning to say pornography made him do it. Not exactly true, totally true. And um, Tana got him connected with James Dobson, and they did some sort of program together. So Tana, who's written about prostitution, the prosecutor, didn't have a clue. He saw prostitutes the way... 18th and 19th century uh, Victorian style uh, people did. The prostitute is filled with disease. She's infecting all these innocent men who are married and who are taking it home to innocent women. She's carrying AIDS. He wrote several pieces on prostitution before he was the prosecutor in our case. So I think that you're right. That's another way where she's different from many male serial killers. She try to cover it up, but she's also a disorganized serial killer. So it's not as if she destroyed the wallets and the credit cards. She just put them somewhere else where they could be found and were found. And she pawned items uh, which could be tracked to her under one of her many aliases. And she ditched the car uh, in another location. But nevertheless, this was not strategic. She wasn't hiding. She wasn't secretive. She was, uh, in a way, not strategic. I'll just say that. I don't want to say more than that. 
Well, I wonder if, do you think that in a way she wanted to be caught then? Is that sort of, or was it laziness or just, why, why would she not cover up better than that? First, I think she was always drunk because to live her life, she had to constantly drink beer. She was very proud that she didn't take drugs and didn't drink hard liquor, but beer galore, like cases a day. And as I think about it again, even though she had certain, she could draw very nicely, and she tried to write poetry in a neat handwriting, which she told me she taught herself, which is a way of saying that no one taught her, and that she wasn't in school. She, she was childlike. She didn't have the mental acuity or the temperament to plan. She didn't plan. See, I think, and she couldn't carry out a strategy with the aim of not being found. So I think after the first killing, something changed, and I write about it in, in Requiem. Um, I think thereafter... If a guy, and this is the full range, and, and at least three of her victims were John because they were found naked and back in the woods where she was once originally raped by her so-called grandfather, father's friend, and impregnated. And I've always thought she's revisiting the scene of the original crime, although I don't think it's the first time she had sex. Or right, anyway, um, she... She had her own version of affirmative action. If a guy was unacceptably rough with her, she didn't have to take it anymore. She could kill him. And if a guy, this is the extreme, if a guy turned her down when she needed his money so she could eat, and his money by this point in her mind belonged to her too, why didn't she have it? She might have killed for that reason. Um, that I'm not totally positive about, but I suspect it's true. Or if a guy says, listen, I'm a cop, and there were two who showed her, flashed badges at her of the seven, and you're going you're gonna to give me a lot of sexual pleasure, and I'm not going to pay you a dime because I could turn you in. I could take you to jail. If a guy did that, she killed him. She didn't have to cower in fear anymore. She She could be... Not the prey, but maybe more of the predator. If a guy wanted something that she didn't want to do, <clears throat> that struck her as filthy or disgusting or painful, and he insisted on it and he wrestled with her, she killed him. Hmm. This was this is my own attempt at theorizing what happened after the first self defense. And if she had been a legal person, you know, with a family that would back her up, she had no one, and could go to the police and say, this guy, he came at me, I, I hitchhiked, but then he tried to kill me, and I had to kill him in self-defense. How many police officers would believe a prostitute who's essentially already an outlaw? Right, right. Do you, do you think that she became kind of a... Uh a vigilante in a sense, like uh, that she was almost on the lookout for people that were, you know, bad? No, I don't think she had that in her because she was hitchhiking. That was her, her disguise was to pass for ordinary, just look like any woman and cut off shorts and a tank top and nothing special, no makeup, nothing. You know, a woman whose car just broke down who had to pick up her kids from daycare and then she'd proposition them. So, she was really unusual. Yeah. As well, I did say, she have a plan? Did she have a plan? Like was I she, do you not know? think so. I mean, I think many women, and remember, she did the killing a year before the film Thelma and Louise came out. And a lot of women saw her as a Jesse James for us, a, an outlaw, a badass, but who was somehow 
Uh, do you know, th- there was a bandit queen in India, Fulan Devi, who had been brutally gang-raped by a village, and she then became a bandit, and she ultimately killed all of the men who had gang-raped her. So some, uh, it, it's a very sensational and interesting story, but some women or feminists saw her as she killed where we could not stop fathers from raping ch- their children, where we could not free women from dungeons and brothels who are chained to the trafficking wall. Um, so she was seen, even though she was not a political actor, and even though she herself was very psychiatrically challenged, uh, and she would not go for an insanity plea, absolutely not, e- even though we all suggested that this is the only thing that would spare her from being executed, but didn't matter. So she, she didn't see herself as a feminist, but the first time I got a phone call from her when she was in jail, um, she picked up the feminist lingo really fast a very quick study. And she wanted women's rights people to demonstrate and to testify. She called us the testifying witnesses, which doesn't mean any more than Valerie Solanas, who shot Andy Warhol, was a feminist political figure. So so Lee, everyone called her Lee, not Eileen or A. Lee, Carol Warnos, Lee was a dazzling figure of someone at the very bottom of society who rose to the top and who also became notorious. And many of her fans, and she has fans, I didn't realize that, see her that way. Everything stacked against her, all the decks stacked against her, and she got to the top in terms of celebrity as if celebrity is is the top, you know, notoriety, mm. celebrity. Okay, let's, I, I was going to say, how do you think she was to, to talk to and to meet as compared to what the press and the movies and things like that have portrayed her? Do you think it's fairly accurate, or do you think it's she was way different than what you expected? Well... By the time I met her in person, she had been sent to death row. On the phone before that, she, her, she, I think she was also a multiple personality because her voice switched a number of times. There was a girlish, husky, soft, slightly shy voice. Then there was a commanding, angry, you're going to do this voice, like her marine voice. And once when she pawned some goods, she told the pawn shop owner that she was Cammy Green, the marine, going to Saudi Arabia or something. So the media only got her in part, only in part. Uh, she cursed a lot. She used the language of poor people in America. Uh, down on their luck, on the road, moving from place to place. I I don't want to curse on the air, so I'm not going to tell you what she said, but you can read it in the book. And (laughs) she, it was a kind of a soldier, military man lingo, a police officer lingo that she used, and with a lot of curse words. She also got very angry, and her eyes bulged out when her face turned red, and this was... That's organic. That that's neurological, and that happened too. See, the media, the feminist writing about her, um, analyzed how she was represented in the media, and also gave her every benefit of every doubt. I, I don't think it's fair to say that feminists idolized her, but we were damn impressed by how could this down on her luck low life do this when we all educated ladies, you know, arguing against rape, 
arguing for battered women who kill finally in self-defense but who invariably get life sentences. We couldn't break them out of jail. Mm. And here, look at what she did. Given that male serial killers routinely kill prostituted girls and women, easy pickings, very vulnerable, all over Florida, she knew that, by the way, which is why she carried a gun. And she said that some police officers who were customers and or friends told her to carry a gun because men understand when you're in a war zone, when you're at war, when you're in combat, you better be armed, at least that. And she was in a war zone her whole life. So I think there was some level of uh, amazed, guilty, grudging respect for her but the media didn't see it that way in general. I mean, what do you remember the media at the time? Yeah. 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 And Mc, uh, you, Nick Broomfield's treatment of her? Yes. Well, you know, yeah, I did a program with Nick. <laughs> well, yeah, but he he had her live on camera, and this is how she came across, you know, swearing like a sailor the proverbial sailor. Mm. So um, she should not have been executed because she was insane, and it's against the law to do that. But as I write, uh, I think Jeb Bush needed to be reelected governor. And even though there were so many women on death row, not to mention men in Florida, who in the subsequent years were resentenced to life, that could never happen to her because I made contact with the Rape Crisis Center and Shelter for Battered Women leaders in Florida, and in Ocala in particular, and they were quite wonderful. And this is a, very, this is a state, North Central Florida, it's like Mississippi. It's racist, it's sexist, and I'm talking about the 1970s, the 1980s, and the 1990s. And um, they said, oh, they're going to burn her for every Southern Belle that joined the National Organization for Women. They said that a prostitute in Ocala, in Daytona, never. A lesbian prostitute? She's not going to get a fair jury. It's not going to happen. And it didn't happen. So, I, you know, I think I think some of the media tried to be really sympathetic to her in terms of uh, abuse in childhood. Um, but she made it a little bit difficult uh, for media, let's say, without a level of knowledge about prostitution or violence against women. I mean, a prostitute is bad is not by one man, but by all of them. Not in every case, but largely, yes. So... What kind of shape could she be in? How could you present a woman who's batted, not a prostitute, is often, she often sabotages her own case because she doesn't present as a witness in a way that's sympathetic to a judge or a jury. Um, she's paranoid. She's super vigilant. Warnos was like this. Um, they've been through hell and nobody came to get them. So they have only themselves, finally, to get to save themselves. And this is like being, uh, it's like being tortured. And you have symptoms forever after of flashbacks and insomnia and of rage and of depression. And you need drugs and you need booze. So you may not be the best advocate for the entire trajectory of your life how do you think she saw herself oh. <clears throat> well she saw herself as someone who never got a break no one ever did anything for her she thought that she had applied to be a police officer and a marine but was rejected because three to five points missing she was off I don't think she applied by the way but it's what she said mm. And she saw herself as doing pretty good 
Thank you very much. Don't mess with me. Don't ask me questions. And she was always angry. She always had a chip on her shoulder. I'll tell you one thing that's different about her. Unlike, for example, Ted Bundy, who picked vulnerable, short or lightweight or uh, uh, victims, she punched up. This is unheard of. She took on men who were a foot taller than her or 10 inches taller than her, who were, who were heavier than she was. Maybe not as young. This is unheard of. And so she learned, and she was proud of this, I think. She learned to immediately fight back, not to wait, not to wait until the pain got so bad, even she couldn't bear it. So she saw herself as able to take it as a tough, one, as a tough hombre, and as one much sinned against, she never had a chance. She would go on and on. She tried to get a job in one of the convenience stores in Florida, but she had to give references. Now, she had no references. She had no family who could give her a reference, fake, saying she worked for them. And so she wondered, could she give her Johns as references? Well, that's not legal. So she saw herself ultimately as someone who became famous, who entered history, she wanted, I didn't see her as really money obsessed, but after she was arrested and then sentenced, something changed. She saw other people making money writing about what she did, and I, I tried very hard to get into her mind and use her language in imagining the year of the killings. And... And also thereafter. So she wanted a percentage. She wanted a piece of the pie. She wanted to keep selling the same story again and again as if it was like selling her body. She didn't understand the feminists, beginning with myself, who wanted to see justice for her and weren't in it for the money. She couldn't understand that because she was the petit bourgeois capitalist. And we were idealists and politicals. So I, I wrote this book because like Anne Rule, the, the late, great Anne Rule, I also have been haunted by my time with a, a very high-profile serial killer who for years I didn't quite acknowledge was really a serial killer because I saw her as this, much abused, much cognitively impaired, much sinned against prostitute who, yeah, became a serial killer. Well, so what is it you hope people um, get from the book? What do they walk away with after they read your book? Well, first, it's a good read. <laughs> it's very fast <laughs> and it's very dramatic, and it's my first time writing true crime and I loved it I loved doing it I loved getting inside her head and I had countless interviews with everyone in her life with her I had inside knowledge trying to work with her public defenders dealing with all the colorful cast of characters who Nick Broomfield gets on camera and they are really quite something and then I interviewed her biological mother, and I interviewed the woman who took the stand against her, um, Tyria Moore. And so it's a tale. I'm telling a tale. And it's about Florida. It's about justice, injustice in American courtrooms. It's about the nature of prostitution. So it's educational and uh, hopefully informative. And it's also, I never before shared the letters that we wrote each other and the history of the feminists who got involved in the case and who tried to send her supportive letters, offer support of one kind or another, send her money for postage stamps, all of whom she blew off. First she asked for a thousand things, and then you were against her, you were her enemy, you know, and she wouldn't talk to you anymore. I don't know whether you think this is typical serial killer behavior. 
Yeah. Really? Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah, well, particular, the, the few I've been involved with, yeah, there's a manipulation there. I, I, the rest of it, no, but about wanting things, yeah. Oh, it was endless. I had to send money to her yeah. childhood friend, Dawn Botkins. I had to, she needed to make, give presents to the other girls on death row who had no one and could buy nothing in the commissary. Um, she needed more stamps. She needed underwear. I mean, fine, I was there to put together a team to save her life and to educate the world about the details of that kind of life. But that's not, that was her least concern. She ultimately wanted to get the crooked cops who she believed made money off movie deals even before they arrested her. I don't know if it's true or not. I do know that one police officer was forced to resign, another left of his own free will in disgust. So who knows what kind of deals were made. I can't say for sure. But that is what she focused on, the cop the authority figures in our culture who should be standing for the right and narrow but who instead take advantage of her and someone like her and get away with it she wanted their corruption exposed she was obsessed with this she didn't want to talk at a certain point not that i needed any more information but she didn't want to talk about her childhood that was for her and she never would talk about the murders other than the first one. And I had to creatively imagine in each case what had happened and what it meant. And I see it through her eyes, or I try very hard to do that. As, as, a, as a result of her crimes, her humanity has really been lost um, in all this. Well, like, There's totally. no focus on her as a human being. You know, hurt people hurt people, right? Yes, yes. And that's why I titled the book Requiem for a Female Serial Killer, because I wanted to bury her, finally, with some dignity and kindness, as well as to pass along the work that I originally had in mind, that I set out to do, which um, maybe this book will do. I, you know, one never knows. Uh, public forum about prostitution uh, in the courtroom, outside of the courtroom. Uh, it also, when I say this is a colorful tale, I mean, she became a born-again Christian on death row, as people do, and um, she had a very colorful, somewhat crazy woman who adopted her, who was a born-again Christian, too, and... I mean, it was an amazing cast of characters, much Americana. But, you know, at the end of the day, I write about a novel that came out in England the year after her spree of murders, who, it, written by Helen Zahavi, whom I don't know, and she has a prostitute, an ex-prostitute, who's totally down on her luck. It's over. She's got nothing and no one. And then some creepy guy starts calling her on her unlisted number, saying terrible things. And amazingly, in a surreal fashion, she kills him to get him to stop. Enough, enough is enough. So she kills seven men, same number in the novel, that Warnos killed, that we know of definitively. And when she was going to be executed and she chose lethal in uh, injection and oh, and, and Lee on court TV said it took me 17 years to finally kill somebody but I got stone cold and said you know enough is enough that's exactly what this fictionalized prostitute said so she asks to be buried in white jeans with a white t-shirt with Christ on it with some kind of earrings that are crosses, a cross necklace, a cross in my hands, and a Bible between my arm and my ribcage. And I write, this is how she wants to be received in heaven. But in terms of being executed by her earthly tormentors, she wants other clothing. She asks to be dressed in a black Harley Davidson T-shirt, biker-style boots, and a military belt. 
So she also wants to be seen as a sh- shit-kicking mercenary, someone who is going out as a renegade at war with the ruling classes, proud and defiant to her very last breath. So she's a religious Christian, a biker outlaw, a marine, a much sinned against child, a happy-go-lucky hooker, a wheeler dealer, and a secretive serial killer. Wow. Uh, <laughs> uh, do you think she would have stopped if she wasn't caught? Do you think she would have kept this cycle up? You know. Or do you think she would have got out of it? That's a good question. Uh I think she could no longer bear the life that she lived. And the only way she could get out of that life, perhaps, is killing or being caught and condemned. She was over way beyond the ledge of the edge. And um, I don't know if she was a stalker. Remember, she was the the damsel in distress by the side of the road, who, um, when I first heard that the police were looking for two women or a woman because somebody was leaving male corpses all over the highway, I thought, what is this, Orson Welles in the Martian landing? Remember that radio broadcast? I said, this is not possible. This is not real. And then I jumped into the story. I don't see her as a stalker, but I do see her as out of control. And so if a man did anything she didn't like, he was dead. So figure the odds. Yeah. Yeah, well, living that life, uh, yeah. chances are it'll happen quite a few That's times. That's it. You know. But I still wouldn't describe that as a stalker. It's kind of... No. I mean, this is like the first time in 10,000 years or since... Columbus landed here, or near here, that there's a woman killing male strangers who are adult male strangers, who are white adult male strangers. This never happened. You have black widows who kill their husbands for insurance money. You have evil nurses, you know, who kill their patients sometimes for also money. You have, um, in the past, you would take babies who were not wanted and say you'll place them, but you'll kill them and take the money, what she did is not usual. This is not done. And they were all, um, from her point of view, kind of upstanding guys with families and children and jobs and badges and big cars, which she didn't have. I mean, she, she, was on, she walked on the highways. She was like a throwback to a primitive age. Everyone else is in a car, and it's air-conditioned, and it's hot. She's walking, almost as if she's from another planet. Now, do you have a website of your own? or? or, or I do, or, I oh, do. And it's, what? it's Phyllis, P-H-Y-L-L-I-S, dash, or hyphen, C-H-E-S-L-E-R, dot com. And the book is right on my homepage, it, uh, Requiem for a Female Serial Killer, and it's New England Review, New English Review Press, and I must, I have an epigraph. This is what Lee said. If men would keep their money in their pockets and their penises in their pants, there would be no prostitution. Wow. A smart little epigraph from someone with too little education. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's been a, a great conversation. We're going to have your book and website up on our site as well. Wonderful, wonderful. You are very good interviewers, and I, I, you know, as, as I said, I'm a newbie to true crime. So, uh, but I like it. Well, that sounds that sounds like a great start. Um, I'm looking through a lot of your other books too, and there there's some pretty interesting topics there. Um, uh, you you address honor killing as well? Oh, yes. Yes, I've done four studies, academic studies, and I often submit affidavits to courts in America when there's a girl or a woman applying for political asylum and who's escaping, who has fled from being honor killed. And that's femicide. Yeah. Uh, 
which we, I mean, I think the male serial killers who prey on prostitutes or on women because they see all women as prostitutes and therefore evil, dirty, etc. Um, that's femicide too. Mm-hmm. So I troll the dark side in my own way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you go. Um, our guest, Phyllis Chesler. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.